If you're an adult amateur horse lover who wonders what it takes to make magic with horses, you're in the right place. I'm Paige Lockton, and this is The Magic of Horsecraft. Join me for conversations with wizards in the world of horsecraft about the ingredients needed to build connection with horses and courage in life. Turns out these things are connected. How do I know? <laughs> like most things, I learned the hard way. I lost the magic I once had with horses. In regaining it, I discovered that the elements of connection are learnable. Whether you ride your horses forwards, backwards, or sideways, stick around for stories that show us how we are the same and that anything is possible. Take a chance. I'm Paige, and this is my dad, Chuck Lockton. Um, he is a veterinarian, and between us, I think we added up about 120 years of horse experience between us. And um, I've been asking him for years now about really boiling down some of the gems of what he wants to share with horse people and what he thinks horses wished humans knew and took into account um, before they worked with them. We debate about this sort of thing all the time and I got really hot on a theory <laughs> called polyvagal theory. No, no, not this again. <laughs> and we have lively debates there about There goes the day. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so some of today is gonna to be spent on why I think it's important that you understand polyvagal theory. Um, but uh, I wanted to kind of introduce you to my dad and have him tell some stories um, and to say how we got here. Um, so as the daughter of a veterinarian, I really wanted to be a vet and um, I helped him. I was helping while horses were coming and going. And as a local vet in a really large area, he um, had all kinds of horse people in. Western, English, standard bred, quarter horse, <laughs> Morgan, Appaloosa, like everything. Heavy horses. Yeah. Um, race horses, jumper horses, dressage horses, little kids' ponies, <laughs> everything. And um, we've been looking for the common threads between them because each of them came in saying, this is the only way to tell a horse to do this and to get results, you know, it's because I'm a this kind of trainer, right? And um, I thought it must be really hard from the outside. If you were new to the horse world, really wanted to learn, and you started searching online, you could drive yourself pretty crazy, eh, Thelma? <laughs> um, with competing methods, and how would you know and how would you choose? And some of them out there that are under the headline of natural horsemanship use methods that people don't understand as nervous system flooding. So I'm really heavily invested in having people understand a horse's nature so that when they try to choose the local pro to work with, and whether or not to use those methods, they can go, oh, okay, well now, understanding a horse and what it needs and how its nervous system works, I can see, oh, and make informed choices wherever you are in the world. So um, I asked my dad, I don't know if he can boil it down. I'm not good at boiling stuff down. Could you boil it down to one thing, dad, that you thought was the most important thing that a horse person knew before throwing a leg over a horse or taking it by the reins. Well, the mobility is the uh, main characteristic that's come down through evolution and through domestication that makes horses useful to man. Uh, just where else, what else do we need from them but mobility? And um, the even the heavy horses, th there are no use stationary they're only of use to us if it's if they're mobile perhaps on a treadmill uh, you might look at it a little differently but even on a treadmill the horse at least thinks it's moving without uh, mobility they, they there's no power without mobility there's no speed um, it was a defining characteristic in their development in that they were prey animals and um, they would graze in one spot then moved for safety sake so that they weren't accustomed to being in one place where they might get preyed upon. Uh, when they were threatened 
leaving, moving was their defense rather than attack. A horse will, if cornered, fight with its front feet and with its back feet, but its first instinct is to leave, to move. Mobility is the big thing with horses. So what happens if um, you go against their instinct that requires mobility in order to feel safe when they're in a scary situation? Now their instinct is, oh my God, I gotta run. How well, do we accommodate that and keep ourselves safe as humans? She's trying to suck me into using the polyvagal theory. <laughs> not yet, not yet. That's coming though. He's smart. <laughs> if you, you, you um, flood them uh, by totally restricting their mobility, you um, do kick in this polyvagal system that Paige likes to talk about. I discourage too much use of the uh, term or getting too deeply into it because it is complicated. And I think people sort of tend to talk about it to show off their knowledge a little bit. And uh, uh, in fact, I, th I think it turns the listeners off when you get too complicated. So I'm trying not to use all of the terminology that alienated me and just kind of understand it as a system with switches um, and, uh, and why it matters in this case. So we would have to, my dad and I, have horses stand still and accept treatment without movement while we did something vital to save them from further harm. And so there were uh, ethical methods to put them into a nervous system state, which maybe we should kind of go back to how the nervous system works. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me have a stab at it. You keep saying I'm going to alienate people, but if we look at our nervous system as like a radar, always particularly for horses, but for all mammals, on alert for danger, danger will be defined by prior, prior experience, it depends from one beast to the next. Um, and if we evaluate danger, we've got some choices and our nervous system starts to flip gears and things will start to happen automatically. Um, we have to decide as humans, we're predators. So one of our decisions is fight, flight, or another one in shutdown. If your body goes, oh, buddy, you're screwed. <laughs> You're not getting out of here. So for a horse, that might look like being tied to an unbreakable rope, to an unbreakable post, to an unbreakable halter. And it knows at some point its nervous system goes, hey, buddy, this isn't going to end well if you fight. And it flips a gear and puts you into a shutdown mode where you, whether you're a human or a horse or whatever, mammals, a mammals, a mammal, where you don't fight and cause yourself any further harm. There's even a mode that will encourage fawning, which we see in horses and humans, that is to keep people from further harm, and it is something you can't fight. So if you've, if you've ever had dreams of or real situations of trying to run and not being able to, um, just have recurring nightmares of, and no voice, and no run, and there's no of powerlessness, you have probably at some point in your life been in a shutdown mode where other people might have even judged, you know, well, you could have fought back and you're big, I'm six one, you know, why didn't you? And whether it's a human or a horse, your, your body has gone flip, a switch has happened and your nervous system is operating in a way to save you from further harm. So knowing that, if we know what that looks like in horses, that you can do it by chasing them in circles until they're like, fuck buddy, stop chasing me in circles. And they join up with their captor. We're not causing pain. Or if we just snap a bull rip around it while it's tied to something unbreakable until it quits struggling without hurting it and call it natural horsemanship and how a horse would relate to another horse. This is how a stallion would relate to another horse. You know, he sees me as a leader and he trusts me now. I won't hit him with this whip. That horse isn't in relaxed trusting mode. If you know about polyvagal, you'll understand that its nervous system has put it into a shutdown mode and that that's a dangerous thing to do. And if you understand it really well, you'll know why putting vulnerable humans 
with horses in that state so that they can interact with them while they're dysregulated is a recipe for disaster. But people don't get it. So I'm like, well, maybe if they just, they quit fighting about who's right and who's wrong and well, it's better than we used to when we flipped them and beat them and we caused physical pain, you know, and horses got to be shown who's boss. What if we went, well, yeah, let's just learn about this and then you can evaluate the methods you go home and use. Then I think it would save people um, from potential harm. I think you and I have seen what happens when you use methods that worked on ranch horses, bred for centuries to acquiesce and be just like, okay, boss, I'll go to work all day for you, right? To give in. They get a foot in a fence. They go, hey, you want to get me out of here, right? They don't fight and thrash. They got an early give up or they don't get bred, do they? You don't breed the stock horse on your ranch, your ranch horse. Probably from... the way they learn not to pull their foot out of the fence is they do have their feet roped and, and well uh, it's a combination for sure uh, hobbles put yeah. hobbles on them I still think it's a wonderful idea when you're working with a young horse to teach it to hobble um, but if your horse is hobble broken and gets its legs in the fence it will stop um, yeah. there, there are things that we do that uh, involve flooding and uh, are almost uh, irreplaceable, like using the twitch that uh, I used to get you to put on a horse. That causes flooding, and uh, but you can get the horse to temporarily stand immobile mm -hmm. by using the twitch, which would give me time enough to freeze an area where I, I wanted to work. And then you would like me behind my back sneak the twitch off. <laughs> but the by that time, the freezing has, <laughs> yeah. has set in. And from there on, we could work on the horse. Yeah. But uh, uh, earing them, uh, taking a yeah. firm halt on the base of the ear also is a flooding technique. The uh, rodeo uh, people used to use that in a wild horse race. And... Uh, bronc riders used to use it to get mounted on their horse. They would take the ear in their left hand, take their right hand, pull the stirrup up, get their left foot in the stirrup, and then as they swung on, let go oh of the God. ear. Fire! So, <laughs> uh, it, it, there are some flooding <laughs> techniques that um, yeah. have proved helpful. Yeah, when you have to treat and immobilize a horse. Um, but I think one of the key things we're drawing together here is that their sense of mobility for safety is so primary that if we don't accommodate it, we could face dire consequences. They can be explosive yeah. um, and put ourselves in danger. And they will feel better if you can facilitate some sense of freedom and forward movement. So Absolutely. That might look like getting off the horse trailer and your horse is screaming and being a jerk and he wants to run around and you want to stand still and talk to your friends. Well, you know, you would be quick to be like, let him move, but you can let him move and turn him, right? And have control mm -hmm. of the direction. You can let him move and he can be scared and still expect to be like, hey, stay off my, make a bubble around your body with your mm -hmm. elbows or whatever mm -hmm. tools you need so that they always respect your space, mm -hmm. but they're allowed to, you facilitate forward somehow. Mm -hmm. We used to uh, restrain them pretty strongly to uh, float teeth, work on their mouth, until I gradually learned that um, you can probably do most of those things without anywhere nearly as much restraint. If you work quietly with them and leave them with a bit of mobility, let them move their heads a bit and go with them. It makes it difficult for the guy running the, yeah. the uh, tools. Uh, but it, uh, it will take the fear away from the horse mm. or uh, reduce its panic uh, by giving it some mobility, not rigid in cross ties, but able to move a, a bit. You usually have somebody else holding the horse in a halter when you're doing that sort of work, but uh, if that person is rigid, uh, then the horse is going to be rigid and you'll have trouble. 
If this is resonating with you, and you've ever felt a little lost as you navigate conflicting data from horse pros across the disciplines, all claiming to have their own methods or recipes for making magic with horses, and you want the clarity and confidence to make sense of it all, I have a roadmap for you. Check out our foundation course. Consider it Horsecraft 101, from amateur to magician, making magic with horses. A unique group coaching program with live online support that helps adult amateurs from non-horsey families who are seeking understanding and connection become the best stewards for their horses in nine weeks without conflicting data, lack of knowledge, or not knowing where to go to for help. So they understand how and why horses think and react the way they do to create a relaxed and confident relationship. If you're still on the fence, we have a freebie for you. If you're ready, so are we. You can get started at themagicofhorsecraft.com. Until then, take a chance and remember, anything is possible. Well, and I think it's kind of important to note the evolution of um, horse equine dentistry. I think it looks different than when you did it. People got to a point where they said, well, we can't only do that many horses per day. And we can't risk the horse swinging its head around and clipping our assistant. So now it's pretty much standard issue that the horse gets drugged to the point where it's vertical, but it's legless, like its head's just hanging. And its head gets suspended from something with a thing to open its jaws and away they go. And all the tools are electric. The the drugs have changed markedly. Uh, When I went through veterinary college there were 65 of us in the class and only five of them female because a lot of our practice was large animal cattle or horses or other larger animals and uh, it took more strength to handle them and uh, now with the drugs we have there are but still the drugs are nearly all injectable and sometimes to use an injectable drug you may have to use a flooding technique like like the ear holt or the twitch i both those things always bothered me that we had to use them and i still think there's occasions when you have to uh, but they're for very temporary use i learned one very late in my career on speed axle and i came out of the dressage ring and she came out of the ring kind of like a chicken on acid or something like she's just all over the place and we were supposed to stop and discuss and she was going to go around him in circles and Jimmy just reached out like this and went on her shoulder and there's a line Mm -hmm. along the point of the shoulder and she went like this her eyes softened she got a dreamy far far away look and she just stood there kind of drooling until he was done talking to me and then he patted her and let go and she went woo (laughs) I never figured that one out, but I... Well, it's a good one. (laughs) Is it? Yeah, well, you're not reaching at their head. They don't begrudge it. They don't become head shy. It doesn't hurt them. You grab a chunk of muscle like that and get it at the right point, and they just go... (laughs) That was useful. You'll have to teach me that one. Well, yeah. I'm an old dog, but there's still a trick or two left in me. Um... So there's all, I think there's all kinds of threads of polyvagal through theories of horsemanship that kind of, if you knew how, how a nervous system worked, you would know how to make some choices in difficult situations and, and how to manage them. I think one of um, the things I want to touch on each time is the um, thing we hang our hat on, everything on is, um, now I'm having name blank, a moment of aphasia, uh, do the best you can until you know better, and when you know better, do better. Mm-hmm. Maya Angelou. That's what I was trying to. Sh- I was trying to think of Maya Angelou's name. But when we do the best we can until we know better, and um, you know, techniques of handling horses have certainly improved since what you witnessed as a kid. But um, I've learned there's still a long way I have to go. That most of my horses and the techniques I tried to teach were like, well, you just come in and with your aura and your six foot one and your energy, show them they're okay and who's boss. But it didn't necessarily work for the kid that was five foot two and um, was trying to do the same I don't know whether you were things. ever as short as five foot two. I wasn't, that's what I'm saying, <laughs> yeah. No, I was pretty much born this tall. And so I always expected and got compliance from horses. And I would do things like, um, this was an interesting theory I've, I've 
research and I, I want to research and credit it to the right person, which I think was either a Chris Irwin or a John Lyons article I read it in. And, um, and so they watched some people warming up in a scary jumper ring where there were scary poles in a corner. And some of the riders were like, come on, and put the horse in shoulder in and kept the horse in shoulder in, kept its eye away from the scary thing and pushed it towards it until eventually the horse quit going, hey, I think it's scary and you're not paying attention and eventually gave in. But the riders that came out went, oh, that? Yeah, I see that scary thing. You know what, buddy? I don't think it's scary, but if you do, let's move away from it before it scares you. And every time they came to that corner, before the horse spooked, they leg yielded away from it. The horse went, oh, you see that? And it's not to be afraid of, and you respected me. And the horses go like butter. I think we saw Schiller do that in one of his yeah. lessons. But it was, and I'm going to have to look this up, either um, Lyons or Irwin that I read it in. And I was like, what? I just always put them in shoulder in and brought them down the road past the scary thing. And, well, some of my riders weren't strong enough, right? And their horses could push through shoulder in. So that's somewhere where um, kind of understanding... Um, how we interact with our horses and oh I knew another thing I wanted to to touch on how so how does the nervous system state of the handler beyond someone that is handling a horse and saying you must be immobile if we had someone that was allowing mobility but there was something in some of the handlers that made your horses nervous and difficult for you as a veterinarian and something in some of the other handlers that made them really easy and safe. Mm -hmm. Classic example was uh, worming horses. At one time, the uh, only really successful way to worm horses was to pass a stomach down, down through the nose into the stomach. And uh, at one time I was worming a Rocky Mountain Ranch stable uh, and uh, they had 120 some horses and I was trying to do it in one day and uh, had a, an assistant that uh, was a good cowboy. He'd uh, traveled the circle, circuit a bit and was a bull rider and a pretty good cowboy, but a really high strung guy. And we started out into disaster. Uh, the horses would fight and um, their noses would bleed and I'd have a really tough time intubating them. And through an accident of, of time and space and uh, another gentleman, the owner of the place, Johnny Viss, came along and took over holding the horses for me and there was a total difference. Uh, Johnny relaxed and easy gone, and um, the horses would relax and, and were not nervous or afraid. With the other fellow handling them, it wasn't that he was afraid of horses or had much fear at all. He was a bull rider, so you've got to conquer some fear to get that job done. Anyway, he was tense and high strung. Horses can sense that. They can particularly sense it if they can get those no get their nose on you, especially if you leave the nose hairs on them, and um, they can actually sense it down reins. They can feel your mood or or excitement or fear. They can sense it uh, d down through the reins, even on a draft team, a heavy team with the long reins you have on them. They can somehow feel what you're, you're feeling. And um, that's a situation we don't 100% understand, but um, there are explanations from the nervous system. A good example is a dog that's sitting by the table waiting for you to uh, maybe drop them a uh, a crumb and when you think now I've got a piece of gristle here I'm going to give that poor dog the piece of gristle the minute you think about doing it the dog's up on its hind legs and licking its chops and right up there and you haven't made a move yet to uh, give but the thought went 
from from one part of your brain, from the part that does the thinking, to the part of the brain that does the action, and that impulse is apparently sensed by animals, and they can tell, often tell, when you're going to do something. It can be roughly explained um, physiologically, but in fact it's uh, a mystery to, to most of us how, how they do sense um, your feeling. As soon as you walk into an arena, a horse can sort of tell by your own attitude or by some electrical impulse that comes from your body what kind of a mood you're in. And um, what kind of a mood you're in really affects how they react to your handling and training. Somebody that's uptight and tense better not try and teach a horse new tricks. You better get on there and relax and let the horse do you some good. Well, here is where polyvagal theory and my understanding of it comes into all of that too. Um, so it, if you if you wrap your head around it, you understand trauma responses, you understand uh, the training that I did in Montana and every, all the research I've been doing ever since with heart math has um, measured electromagnetic fields that we have that we project from our hearts. Mm -hmm. Horse's heart is much larger than a human heart's, more than six times larger. So it has an enormous energy field, and it's through this that we transmit all this stuff. So it's um, more than can be disseminated in our little chat here this afternoon. But I just I keep finding threads of you know if people understood this, they would understood understand um, victims' trauma responses. Uh, there would be you would go to a, react with your horse when something needed to be established and be able to choose from a list of tools that hopefully didn't put them into a flooded state, but that got cooperation. And I think it allows you to look at the world differently. So I'm going to incorporate it into part of a larger course that my dad and I um, keep threatening to put out in the world. <laughs> it's a few more months away and a beta version. If you want to be a beta tester, I'm ready for beta testers. And it's a combination of good old-fashioned horse wisdom and stories of if you ignore these things about horses to your peril that we have learned through trial and error. <laughs> and the science of equine instincts. And so if you understand equine instincts and um, what they need, you can ride them forwards or backwards or sideways or drive them. You can choose your experts and how you interact with them, I think, with... Um, some structure and conscience and in line with your integrity. So that's kind of what we hope to do once we get out there. That's what I hope to do. What do you hope to do? Oh, <laughs> I, I hope to pass on some of the hard learned uh, lessons that you and I have both had over the years. We're, we are not pretending that we know any more than anybody else, but we've probably made more mistakes than most other horse people and have hopefully learned from them. Yeah, that's the point. Um, so I'm running a beta program. Um, eventually there'll be sort of a safe space to meet. There's six modules of stuff and potentially over a six or a 12 week period with some extra exercises. And um, eventually my <laughs> I can get it formatted, an ebook to go with the program. Um, but yeah, connect with me if you want to know more. In the meantime, have fun with your horses. Ciao. Hey, you're still here. Thanks so much for listening. What you think and feel matters. If this resonated with you, please like and share. It truly makes a difference. I encourage you to engage with the content on my Substack account and my socials, all at The Magic of Horsecraft where you can join the discussion and shape the future shows. Tell me what you want to hear more of or less of, and we'll evolve together as we grow a community of like-minded souls here for the good of the horse. If you're an adult amateur horse lover looking for confidence and clarity in your role of equine steward, check out my course, From Amateur to Magician, Making Magic with Horses at themagicofhorsecraft.com. Until then, I'm here to remind you of a couple things. One, underneath it all, 
We all want the same things, to be heard, understood, and accepted for who we are, and to anything is possible. Take a chance. <laughs>